Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor at Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen here is a telephone number. That's the church office. Uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. Great crowd for a Sunday after Thanksgiving. I, my phone lit up this morning. Several people mentioning they're just sick and asking for prayer. So I know quite a few folks are not feeling well today and there's still some traveling, but this is a great crowd. So glad you were here as we begin our Advent season. The anticipation of the, the coming of Jesus at his, at his birth. And man, have we worshiped already this morning or what? I mean, just recognizing who he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm excited about our, our series as we journey through Matthew. If you've not already done so, I hope you brought your journal back with you. Um, some of you maybe weren't here last week, and I'm going to provide an opportunity for you to grab a journal if you don't have one. If uh, you don't have one of these yet. We're gonna, we've given these out, and uh, basically throughout the course of our study through Matthew, it's a scripture journal. On one side, it has the scripture. On the other side, it has a place for you to take notes. And so we want everybody, guests and everybody, to have one of these. And uh, so, Herb, if you could see if everybody makes your head has one of those, it'd be great. Raise your hand if you need one, and uh, Herb will get you one. But guests, everybody, we want you to have one and want you to follow along. We're not going to be reading a... There's a couple over here. There's some more out on the table out there too, so, yep. All right. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. It's where we're going to be this morning. We're not going to read a lot of Matthew because we're actually beginning a, a short series through the characters of Advent. Last week we talked about about the genealogies, and we talked about the significance of those genealogies, and, and we're going to, over the course of the next few weeks, uh, engage a few of the characters that we see in the genealogy of Jesus. And today, we start uh, with Abraham. Matthew 1, 1 says this. Wrong page. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, I'm in no ways, no way at, at all a famous person, nor am I related to any famous people. I don't know if you are or not. Anybody in the crowd just, you, you're, a little, you're a little starstruck when you see somebody like really famous, you're kind of starstruck. Any self-confessed star, there's a few pointing fingers at each other. My wife is that away. My wife is that way, man. If she sees somebody like, like we were at this event and it was like the producer of something, and she's like, I think he produced that movie, and you know, I mean, she just goes, she goes crazy over star uh, or, or seeing somebody famous. Um, I, I'm not famous. I don't really know anybody famous, but I have a, I have a, I have a relative that that comes close. Has any have any of you heard of the name Mark Lowry? 
Any, yeah, a few, a few Mark Lowry folks in the, in the crowd. Sang with the Gaither vocal band, a uh, Christian comedian. Um, he's, actually, he's actually my cousin. This is my, this is my small claim to fame. Mark, Mark Lowry um, happens to be my cousin, all right? Um, he's the author of Mary Did You Know, by the way. Did you know he wrote that? Yeah, he wrote Mary Did You Know. So I find out that Mark Lowry, I'd, I'd never met him. Um, but I find out that he's coming to SBU, my college campus. So I get, to, I get with the guy who's coordinating the concert, and I say, hey, listen, I, I'm Mark Lowry's cousin, and I hear he's coming. I, I'd love for an opportunity to meet him. He's like, oh, you're his cousin, huh? And I'm like, yeah, I'm Mark Lowry's cousin. He goes, he goes, describe to me how you're related to Mark Lowry. So I start name dropping, right? I'm like, hey, listen, uh, uh, Uncle Kenneth and Aunt Deanie, that's, that's his aunt and uncle. Uncle, uncle Kenneth um, is the brother to Mark Lowry's dad and James. And, 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 and I start naming the cousins. They're, like, they're all first cousins. He's like, ah, man, okay. I'll set it up for you. I said, I appreciate that. So Mark Lowry comes to our campus and uh, I get a chance to meet him. I go up to him and I say, hey, Mark, nice to meet you. I'm your cousin. And he goes, what do you want? And I'm like, I don't want anything. I'm just, I'm your, co I'm your cousin. He goes, he goes, how are you my cousin? So I have to name drop. I have to go through my family line. I'm like, listen, Uncle Kenneth and Aunt Deanie. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, like James and Jennifer and, and, and my cousins. I mean, and Joanna. And I start name dropping all these cousins. And he's like, impressive. Well, nice to meet you. And he turns around and walks away. <laughs> so I call my cousin James, who who happens to be his first cousin. Are you tracking with me here? My first cousins are his first cousins. So that, that has to make us related somehow, right? So I call my cousin James and I say, James, I just met my cousin Mark and uh, he didn't believe me at first. And even when I dropped a few names, he was very skeptical. And then he just kind of walked away and he said, yep, that's, that's, that's Mark Lowry. He's, he's just kind of on to the next thing. He's got ADHD, right? So he's like, whatever's next. And uh, he said, well, who did, you, who did you name drop? Who did you say? And I said, well, I said, I said, you. I said, James, my cousin James. He goes, well, that was your first mistake. <laughs> he said, you've got to be careful when you're name dropping. You've got to be careful who you include in the line, right? Because there's some people in your family line that you want to name drop, and there's other people you want to forget are in your family line. Well, as we begin this moment of Advent, this season of Advent, this, this journey through um, some of the characters of Advent. Make no mistake about it. The, the people that Matthew included in his genealogy are there on purpose and with a purpose. And they are, there's no mistake that they're there. Matter of fact, it is so incredibly significant that they're there that we want to take a few moments and just kind of unpack and think through why are they there and, and how does that relate to, to you and I today? What are the practical takeaways for you and I as we walk through a, a character study of Abraham? Just to catch you up to speed, if you weren't here last week, I mentioned why genealogies were important, especially to the, to the Jewish people. They were incredibly important. They were, proved, they were used to prove one's identity as a Jew, as a partaker in the blessings of Abraham. And by the way, just so you know, I am going to try my hardest not to break out into Father Abraham had many sons today. <laughs> But it has taken everything I have all week long. It's been buzzing around in my head. Um, so if, if I break out in it, you guys know me. I, I, I kind of tend to break out in song every now and then. Oh, heck, let's just do it. Are you ready? Father Abraham had many sons. <laughs> many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Okay, that's it. Oh, that's it. We got it out of our system. I sang it. I feel good about it. It's all good. This is the Jewish people. And part of their, part of their process of, of keeping these genealogies was because they needed to be rightly related to the right people and partakers of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Each of the Jewish tribes had uh, received a land inheritance in Israel. So for a person to inherit that land, they had to be able to, to prove who they were descended from. They were also significant 
as Jewish male to serve, whether or not they could serve in the Levitical priesthood. You see, priests could only come from the tribe of Levi and descendants of Abraham, the brother of Moses. And so, so these genealogies were really important. They, they mattered and they, they, they pointed to the past and they point to the future and they, they tell us a story as we journey through Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. From the very get-go, Matthew states in a definitive way the purpose for this book, the reason he is name-dropping. And it is all about Jesus the Christ. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. He begins by telling us that Jesus Christ is the main character. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So everything that comes after this name is going to point us to who Jesus is. The Messiah has come. But because it was important for for the Jews, especially thinking genealogy here, It was important to know where they came from. So Matthew begins by saying he is the son of David and the son of Abraham. But why? Well, because these are the two giants of the faith. And they represent the the two great covenants that we see in the Old Testament. We see the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Your throne will be established forever. We see the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12. I will make of you a great nation and all nations will be blessed through you. If Matthew, really, if the entire Bible claims, and it does, that Jesus is the fulfillment of these two covenants, then he must be able to answer the questions that the Jews were certain to ask. Is he related to the right people? Does he come from the rightful line? And so from the very beginning, the answer is yes, yes, yes. This is the long-awaited Messiah the prophets foretold about. This is the long-awaited Messiah the people of God hoped for. Hope. Now there's an interesting word. It's the first Sunday of Advent, and it's the Sunday of, of hope. Hope is an interesting word. I'm, my guess is you've probably said it this morning, haven't you? Can anybody just think back? You've already probably said, it was probably in the form of this. Man, I hope my back doesn't hurt when I get out of this bed. <laughs> Man, I hope there's no snow on the ground. Man, I hope this, this cloud that socked Colorado Springs in lifts up. Uh, man, I hope Bill has something interesting to say today. Man, I hope he p- preaches shorter than he usually does. Man, I hope there's donuts. Hope is a very interesting word, is it? It's kind of like the word love. We just kind of throw it out in everything. We love pizza and we love Jesus all in the same breath, right? Hope is a little bit like that. Hope is kind of one of those words that is, that is kind of loaded because we not, we're not sure if it, if it communicates a, a certain something or a hopeful something. It's a word I've heard a dozen times just on the news this week as I was processing through this sermon. I hope the hate stops. I hope the victims are okay. I hope everyone has enough to eat this Thanksgiving. I hope the election results will change the course of the country. I hope the election results won't change the course of this country. We all have hopes, don't we? And we verbalize them in so many different ways and in so many different contexts. But listen, church, there's a, there's a difference between worldly hope and biblical hope. And as we think through the story of Abraham this morning, I want us to, 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 to move aggressively towards biblical hope and away from worldly hope. What is worldly hope? Well, worldly hope is this. It's, it's kind of a, a veiled pessimism. We really don't believe something's going to happen, but if we say, I hope it happens, then, then just maybe, maybe it will turn out okay. So it's a bit of a, of a veiled pessimism. I hope, but I won't believe it until I see it. Hope, it's a temporary illusion. It's one of those things that that gets us through a significant uh, crisis in our life or or an event in our life. I mean, we can look around and and we can read story after story of of people who survived incredible things because of hope. But, But at the end of the day, there's a there's a, a worldly mindset that says it's, it's not really a virtue. It's just kind of a temporary illusion. 
And then many would just say this, hope is nothing more than wishful thinking. Is that true? Is that true for us as followers of Jesus? Is that true for us as we look forward to the coming of the Messiah on this first Sunday of Advent? I am here to tell you, church, hope has a name. And his name is what? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, hope has a name. And his name is what? Jesus. Jesus. Hope has a name, church. Our first character of Advent, of Advent, Abraham, he knew this. And he lived accordingly. It shaped who he, who he was. It informed how he behaved. It changed the way he did what he did. The reality of it is this. It was not a veiled pessimism or temporary illusion or wishful thinking for Abraham. Abraham understood what you and I desperately need to understand and desperately need to walk in. And this is kind of the big takeaway for the day. If you're taking notes in your journal, write this at the top. Christian hope is secure, is securely and solely based upon the words and actions of God. Christian hope is securely and solely based on the words and actions of God. Of God. We're going to see it all throughout Abraham's story, and we're only going to scratch the surface because, because there is so much in God's word that, that, that we could kind of land on when we think about who Abram, Abraham was. Christian hope is securely and solely based upon the words and actions of God. It isn't hoping that somehow God will find a way. It isn't hoping that, that, wow, when he looks down and goes, oh, how did that happen? I better fix that. I hope I can fix that. No, biblical hope is the notion of waiting with confident expectation that God is going to show up in the middle of our stuff. He's going to show up in the middle of our life in all of its circumstances. Biblical hope is the hope of what God will do in the future based on what he has said in the past. I mean, think about it, church. Think about all the ways that we're, we're counting on God and we've not seen him show up yet in some of those ways. But he said he was going to. He said when, when we needed strength that he would be our strength, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a promise in the past that we can have confidence in because of something he has said and something that he will do in the future. Matter of fact, if you flip over to Ephesians chapter one, I wanna show you the, the definition of somebody without hope. Paul gives it to us in Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, referring back to these covenants. Why? Having no hope without God in the world. Those with no hope are defined as people without God in the world. But Abraham hoped. And in Abraham, we get to, to kind of see kind of through two lenses. We get to kind of read um, from, from the past forward, right? We get to kind of see it unfold. We get to read one chapter at a time. And, and we see God say this to Abraham and Abraham obey. And we get to kind of watch it unfold. So we get to look at it through the lens of the past. But we also get to look at it through the lens of, I mean, the lens of the future. But we also get to look at it from the lens of the past, right? Because we see this icon of the faith. We see this, this, this man who, who simply believed who God was. His hope was securely and solely based on the words and actions of God. So turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to spend a bulk of our time walking through several chapters of Genesis. You can keep your finger in Matthew chapter 1 or, or, or whatever you need to do. But I want, us to, I want us to think about a couple things this morning as we are challenged and encouraged to, to, to put our hope in Christ. We pick it up in chapter 11. This is his birth narrative through his death in chapter 25. We're not going to read it all. 
But if we were to sum it up, we would, we would see words like this, obedience, calling, deception, rescue, blessing, intercession, testing, destruction, sacrifice, provision, and covenant. But why does, the Abraham, why does Abraham's story matter? Why is it significant that Matthew opens the genealogy naming Jesus as the son of Abraham? Remember, our Jewish audience Simply put, it's this, without Abraham and his obedience and faith in God's word and actions, <laughs> there is no hope because there is no Jesus. With Abraham, we have hope because we have Jesus, the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the true Jew, Abraham. So what do we learn from Abraham? Let me give you a couple things just to kind of hold on to as you begin this season of Advent and as we as the people of God remind ourselves of why we are different than those who are in the world without God. The first is this. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. What can we learn regarding hope from Abraham? What are some of the applications for us today? We need to understand that Abraham believed God. God. Stay there in Genesis. You don't have to turn to Romans. I want to read a, a passage out of Romans. And this is, this is one of those looking back moments. And then I want us to pick back up in Genesis, but Romans 4, 13 through 22. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be an heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And if we were going to sing, what would we sing? Father Abraham, had, right? We're not going to, we're not going to. He is the father of those who have faith. As it, is, as it is written, verse 17, I have made you the father of many nations. That was the covenant, right? I've made you the father of many nations. God did what he said he was going to do. And I did it in the presence of, of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in his faith when, it, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was a, about 100 years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No, unbelief, no, or no, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He did not waver concerning the promise of God, but instead he grew strong in his faith and gave glory to God. Why? Because he was fully convinced, church, that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham believed God. You don't believe me? Look back at Genesis chapter 12. God spoke, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You don't think he believed God? Look at verse 4. So Abraham went. Genesis 13. Look at verses 14 through 17. God spoke. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Abraham believed God because in verse 18, what does it say? Abraham or Abram moved his tent. 
God spoke, Genesis 15, one through five. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham, or Abram said, to, said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and the number and number the stars if you are able to. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. What does verse six say? He believed the Lord and it counted unto righteousness. Are you getting the pattern here? <laughs> we could go on in Genesis 22 too. What happened in Genesis 22 too? Abraham, take your son, your only son, and go to the, the place I will show you and sacrifice him. This is the son of promise. This is the, the son that was born to him at 100 years old. What did Abraham do early in the morning? I would have slept in church. If God said, hey, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice him, I would have slept in. I would have made sure the alarm was not set the next morning. But the Bible says that Abram, Abraham got up early and went. Listen, you don't continually respond to what God says if you don't believe what God says. If you're not fully convinced that, that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do, you do not respond in obedience. But Abraham demonstrates the kind of hope that you and I have, a hope that is solely based uh, securely and solely on the words and actions of God. He didn't have a lot of instruction. He didn't have a lot of details. All he knew is this is what God was telling him to do. And because he believed God, he obeyed. That's the kind of hope that you and I can have this season. That's the kind of hope you and I can walk in every day of our life. Abraham demonstrated it over and over again, and he challenges you and I to do the same. I was thinking through my own life and my own journey, and I was just kind of processing moments and markers along the way where, where, where I had to kind of come to a decision point. Well, was I going to really believe God, or was I going to just doubt it, Right? And uh, I, I, I often run back to my experience, my wilderness experience, the four years I spent in Washington State. I was in seminary. I was broke. Um, but before we ever got there, the only reason we got there was because one night Kelly and I were praying and we felt like God was telling us that he wanted us to go to seminary and go to the Northwest. So I made a phone call to a friend in the Northwest and I said, hey, I'm looking into this process. What do you think? And he says, I know exactly what I think. I was just, we're, our church has just been praying that God would provide us a student pastor. Why don't you come out and hang out with us and, and we'll interview and we'll see what happens. And so we went out and, and God made it crystal clear. Uh, that's what he wanted us to do. Uh, but the church couldn't really afford it and there was a lot of questions around it. So they said, why don't you guys go home and pray? We'll pray and, and we'll just see how God leads in this. And so one night they call and Kelly and I are kind of both on the phone. This is back in the day when you had to go like this. So both people could listen to the phone. And, um, and we're, we're both on the phone and, and the pastor says, hey, I got some good news and I got some bad news. And I'm like, okay, what's that? He goes, well, the good news is, man, the church is excited for you to come out and, and go to seminary and, and be our student pastor. What's the bad news? We can pay you $500. That's all. We can pay you $500 a month. I'm like, okay. He goes, but I got some good news. I said, okay, more good news. That's good. What's that? He goes, there's a lady in our church who can rent you an apartment for $600 a month. And I'm like, hey, I'm no dummy, but I'm already $100 in the hole here, Pastor. We hung up. My wife, so my wife is crying. And all I can say is, yes, Lord. Now, how did I get to that point? Was it because I have this incredible faith? No, not at all. Not at all. We had, we had wrestled over this and we had, we had poured over it. But, but there was something about this opportunity that, that kind of shouted to me. And the, the invitation was this, Bill, are you going to believe me? Are you going to believe everything that you learned in seminary about me? My faithfulness, my goodness, my provision. Are you going to believe me for all of those things? Are you going to try to figure it out first? 
So we called him right back and said, yes, we'll be there. The only reason we got to Washington State and the only reason we stayed for four years in Washington State was because God in his grace allowed us to come to a place where we just believed that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And over and over again, and I don't even have time to tell you this morning how many times God provided. One of the funniest accounts, though, we would wake up about once a week and there would be a basket of fruit and stuff on our porch. You know, when you're, when you're not making much money, you, can't, you don't buy fruit, you buy bologna or whatever. And so we were like, fruit, this is awesome. And, if, you know, a guy who just likes meat, I was excited about the fruit. Um, we found out about six months later that that fruit was actually being delivered to the wrong house. <clears throat> but you know what? Thank you, Lord, for the fruit. <laughs> but we had, to, we, had to, we had to believe God. Oh, is it easy? Not at all. Man, I wish I could say I did it flawlessly with no doubts and no second guessing. There would be nights I would lay awake in my bed, anxiety just flooding over my soul, and I had to once again say to myself, Bill, are you going to believe God or are you going to lean on your own understanding? And over and over again, his grace was sufficient. We see that in the story of Abraham. Listen, Abraham doesn't respond with obedience because he doesn't have hope in what God's going to say, but he responds in obedience because he does. Based on the words and actions of God, let me ask you this today. What are you believing God for? What are you hoping today? What are you hoping for today? Not, not wishful thinking, not, oh God, if you could get around to it and make it happen, but the kind of hope where you're, where you're all in. Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to believe you are who you say you are. Or what do you need to believe God for? Maybe there's something in your life right now that you just need to believe God for it, that he will do faithfully according to what he has said and how he has acted. Because biblical hope is securely and solely based on the words and actions of God. Listen, this kind of hope, the hope that believes God will do exactly what he says he will do, is not easy. And I don't want to paint any kind of rosy picture for you, but, it, but it's easier when we know who we're hoping in, right? It's easier when we know that hope has a name, and his name is what? Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus has revealed himself to us. And as we journey through Matthew, we're going to see who he is and what he has done. And doing so, our hope will be strengthened and our Resolve will be strengthened. Listen, we're going to have to wrestle through the reality of circumstances, especially circumstances that, that seem insurmountable. Like there's no way I can overcome that in my life. There's no way that God can work that out of my life. He doesn't, he doesn't know the bigness of my problem. The, the problem is we don't always remember the bigness of our God, do we? Hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Listen, if God can provide for Abraham and Sarah... A hundred years old. And that's just, that, that's just one thing. <laughs> we didn't even go through the list of them. If he can provide for Abraham and Sarah, surely he can provide for you and I. And surely you and I can grow and be strengthened to, to become the people of God who, who do not waver in unbelief, but are strengthened simply because we believe the promises of God. And by the way, this all starts with salvation, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. We understand salvation is a, is, a, is a past, present, and future reality, don't we? I mean, past. There's, there's a moment of time that we came to faith in Christ and, and, and we received salvation. And then we, we grow and we walk in that salvation. That's the sanctification process. And one day, one day when we take our last breath and we stand face to face, our salvation will be complete. If you don't believe God for this, you didn't believe him for this. You see, we believe God is able to save, not just now, but for all eternity. So we believe God and take him at his word. So the very heart of the gospel is at stake. If we don't believe God, we won't experience the salvation of God. Because that's how we have to come to that place where we understand who he is. Believe God. Christian hope is securely and solely based upon the words and actions of God. Second and last, how do we get there? How do we get there? How do we, how do we, how do we strengthen our, our weak limbs? How do we grow in our faith? How do we develop in the Christian life 
uh, more so today than we were yesterday, and more so tomorrow than we are today. How do we move towards faith? Well, we see secondly in Abraham's life where his eyes were fixed, and they were fixed on who? Jesus. Why? Because hope had a name. Hope has a name. And his name is Jesus, right? Abraham fixed his eyes on Jesus. Turn with me real quickly to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let's read a few verses together and a couple thoughts and we'll be, we'll be done this morning. Church, be encouraged. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Verse 48, chapter 8. The Jews answered him, are we not right? Now, this is an interesting moment in the story. Um, Jesus is having a, a very, very tense conversation uh, with the Jewish leaders. There's, there's going to be a, a lot of uh, things that are kind of leveled, accusations that are kind of leveled in this discussion. And they all kind of center around who Jesus is. By the way, this is another reason genealogy is important, because if, if you don't know who you are or, or from where you came, you will not be able to stand your ground, especially in light of the enemy's accusations. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? They just said Jesus had a demon, by the way. Would not recommend it. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Why? Abraham died. You know the relationship between Jews and Abraham, right? This is their father. This is the, the legacy. This is the lineage. Because we are related to Abraham, we are okay. And Jesus says, no, you're not okay. Verse 52, Jesus said to them, or the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And then they ask a really, really, really big question. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? <laughs> Can you hear the answer? Yes. Yes, I am greater than the fa your father Abraham who died. 54, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. You see, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, Jesus' day. The coming of the Messiah, the one the prophets foretold, the people of God hoped for. Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Oh, church, I wish we had more time to unpack this. There are so many things that we need to, to understand. But let me just give you two things to kind of to help put this in context. Because we're like, maybe you're like, what is he talking about? What is, what is he talking about? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. Well, there's a, there's a prophetic level and an experience level. We need to understand that in light of the prophecy, there's been a, a spirit of prophecy that was given to Abraham. And in this spirit of prophecy, he learned that the Son of God would be among men. Galatians 6 refers to it. That his advent, Jesus, by Jesus' advent, he would fulfill the promise of God to Abraham that all nations would be blessed by faith, by him, and faith would be realized. Because in 58, he says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Why is Jesus greater than Abraham? Because Jesus came before Abraham. He claims he is the only begotten son of the father, fulfilling the promise fulfilling the, the, the heart of God for the, the people of God and bringing salvation to men. Over and over again, we see in Abraham's story, him fixing his eyes on Jesus. There's one point, uh, I don't know if you've ever kind of unpacked this in your life, but there's one point when he is taking Isaac up to sacrifice him and they're having a conversation and, and the son says what? He says, well, we got matches and we got some charcoal here, but what, 
where's the lamb? What does Abraham say? God himself will provide the lamb. Already in the, in the book of Genesis, we are starting to see Jesus come into play. He's pointing towards Jesus, the lamb of God, who would indeed come and take away the sins of the world. Actually, you know, from that time on, they, they began to sacrifice a lamb until the, the lamb, Jesus, came. So what's our application? If we're going to walk in hope, <laughs> if we're going to walk in hope, the kind of hope that we see in Abraham's life, the kind of, the kind of hope that the, the advent of, of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the appearing of Jesus, then we have to understand that Christian hope is securely and solely based on upon the words and actions of God. It's not based on how you and I feel. It's not based on how the circumstances look. It's not based on what you and I can kind of understand. And we take out the spreadsheet and we go, okay, here's the pros, here's the cons. The pros outweigh the cons. God must be in it. It's the kind of hope that leans fully and completely on the words and actions of God. And if we're going to do that, then we have to fix our eyes on him. Do you hear... uh, Hebrews 11 and 12 in this passage. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, because he is what? The author and perfecter of of our faith. Listen, fixing our eyes on Jesus means we are not focusing on our situation, our circumstances, our troubles. We're not focusing on on the ask that God may give us in our life and all the, 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 the hills and the mountains around that. We look beyond the here and now, knowing that it'll be done at the second advent of Jesus, his bodily return. See, you and I are already believing God or not because he said he's coming again. And because he's coming again, there's a certain way that you and I should live and a certain posture we should have and and things that we are to do. But if we don't believe God that he's coming again, we won't do those things, will we? Abraham believed God and he fixed his eyes on Jesus. Abraham, really at the end of the day, Abraham saw it before he saw it. If you were to look at Hebrews 11 a little further down, it talks about by faith Sarah past the age bearing. Therefore, one man, verse 12, good as dead. We were born descendants, as many as the stars of the heaven, as many as the immeasurable grains of the sand. <laughs> Reference back to Genesis. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. That was Abraham's posture, and that's, that's it's yours and mine as we, as we believe God and take him at his word, as we, as we fix our eyes on Jesus and, and look above the situations and the circumstances. They can be very, very over, overwhelming, and I get it. But when we lift our eyes to Jesus, all of a sudden the things of earth grow strangely dim, don't they? You've had that experience. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And I'm not going to sing it for you, but I want to read a couple phrases of one of the best hymns ever written. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Listen, what is your hope built on today? Is it wishful thinking or is it the actions and words of the God of the universe, the God who became flesh and made his dwelling among us, the God who we anticipate this time of year coming as a babe in Bethlehem in order to die for you and I that we might have hope eternal. Christian hope is securely and solely based upon the words and actions of God. 
is yours. Father, thanks for your word today. It's challenging. It's challenging to me, Lord. I think of, of several areas of my life, God, where, where I, I drift towards kind of wishful thinking instead of just taking you at your word and believing that you are who you say you are and that you'll do what you say you do. So in this season of Advent, God, as we anticipate the coming of Jesus, fill us with, with hope, not the hope of the world, the wishful thinking, the I hope it works out, but the certainty that comes from a God who not only says what he will do, but does what he says. You can be trusted, God. Help us, no matter what season of life we're in or what situation of our life we're in, I pray that you'd help each one of us, maybe even this morning, to surrender to you, to lean on you, and to say, I'm no longer going to hope in my circumstances changing. I'm not going to hope in in more money coming in or more people coming into my life. I'm going to hope in God solely and securely based on what he has said and what he has done. God, help us to respond obediently and accordingly to what you're stirring in our hearts this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.